Welcome to Sundays at Cafe Tabak, the podcast. Hi, I'm Wanda Acosta. Hi, I'm Karen Song. This podcast series is an extension of our film's mission to affirm and extol the courage, vision, strength, and joy in our LGBTQ community through the preservation and sharing of our personal stories and the collective histories we live through and change. In this episode, we are so thrilled to welcome Hall of Fame basketball legend and New Yorker, Sue Wicks. Her distinguished career is defined by record set and numerous accolades. MVP, All-Star Game and Gold Medal honors. She played forward in the WNBA for our very own hometown team, the New York Liberty, since its inaugural season, and was awarded the 2001 Kim Perot Sportsmanship Award and was consistently voted fan favorite. You will soon understand why. Whether on or off the court, her characteristic humility and empathy makes it no surprise that she was and still is a natural leader and a role model, especially for women, girls, and LGBTQ people. Notably, Sue is the rare pioneer who paved the way for professional athletes to be out during their career. Even now, in her role as owner of Violet Cove Oyster Company here in Long Island, she is making her mark as an oyster farmer and environmental activist for New York's waterways. Now, join us as Sue shares her incredible journey with us and her coming out story. I'm really, really uh, grateful. Thank you so much for joining and saying yes to a, an interview. I've been wanting to actually talk to you about your legacy and your story and now your present story. And we never really get a chance to do that. So I'm happy that we're able to do that here and also hear about your coming out story. Thank you so much. And I'm so honored and a little intimidated because I see you have so many intellectuals and um just cultural people that you've already interviewed. So I feel it's a nice break and we have an athlete and I guess an oyster farmer now. What a, you know, what a break from uh, all your award-winning uh, filmmakers and writers. Oh my God. You're a, a, you're, a, you know, a hall of famer. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, different feel. Oh, I'm so I, excited to have you. <laughs> I also feel like female athletes are just the whole other level of also intellectual. It's just like a different thing. You know, I've, pl- I've been an athlete my whole life as well. So I just feel like female athletes, it's it's not like that quote dumb jock thing. Like there's just another level, especially where you've come from and your background. And we're so honored and excited to have you today. Oh, thanks for saying that. I, I feel like I've played with such brilliant women and, you know, different types of intelligences, different places that they're coming from. But certainly, um, athletic genius is something, you know, and it's a base to work from. And I just, with amazingly talented and intelligent women in sports that I've met. So thanks for saying that. Were you always athletic as a young woman? Yes. Always in love with sports. And I also like dolls for whatever reason. I don't know why. I love dolls and I love Ken dolls, Barbie dolls, all type baby dolls. And my mother and father, you know, they got me boxing gloves, they got me hockey sticks, they got me a pellet gun, whatever my brother had, I had. So I got double. So I got all of those awesome toys that we played with with 95% of the time. But I guess they were like, well, let's just get her the doll. She seems to like it. You know, it may work. <laughs> they like they knew who I was when I was a little child. They weren't trying to make me fit them all. They're like, That's what she wants. Get her a pellet gun. <laughs> Wonderful. Where did you grow up? Long Island. So this is a a bit of a full circle Ah, for you to coming back and doing your farming business on Long Island. Completely full circle. I left when I was 17 um, to go to college. And when I left, you know, the last job I had was working at the fish market and on my dad's boat and probably the only job I really ever Uh had. And then I traveled all around the world. You know, after Rutgers, I tried, there was no WNBA. So I I went right away to Lake Como. And then Mm. I went all over the world. I put in, you know, many different countries and and played in many different countries. And then when I came back, um, I lived in New York until I was 50. And then when I was 50, I was running um, a small startup business and we sold that business. And I was like, what next? What do I want to do? And there was just this gravitational pull that has always existed and it has to do with the water that I was like, I'd like to be 
back on Long Island. And I, I have to tell you, that has been an experience. But the thing that's constant is my love of this mm-hmm. water. Absolutely. I share that. I think we all do, but yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. I surf, so I spend a lot of time in the water. Oh. <laughs> And I'm living by the water yeah. in Puerto Rico, so not at not at this moment. But and yeah, so I totally understand the um, transcendent effect of of water for sure, oh, yeah. especially now too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So when you were young, it seems like your parents didn't kind of impose things like gender, you know, things on you. And so I, I don't know if they were the most important people that you came out to in your life. But what was coming out for you? Uh, what's your story? It's so funny, you know, you mentioned my parents. So when I was a little girl, I had all this blonde, curly hair. And my dad used to wash me when my mom was at work and it was a hot day. And my mother comes home. And my father gave me a crew cut. And I'm out in the lawn with a crew cut with my brother who had the same haircut. He gave us both without my shirt on. And my mother loses her mind. And he's like, and again, the same thing. It's what she wanted. <laughs> four years old. <laughs> four years old. <laughs> <laughs> it was what she wanted. <laughs> Wonderful. So I think my father always probably um, was like, this is a strange child, but you know, <laughs> it's it's my child <laughs> and whatever. So my parents are both products of the 50s and you do the right things and there's very defined gender mm. roles. And um, what a woman does is very, very defined. You know, there was anything outside of that was not right. I didn't date anybody in high school. Um, I dated a couple of boys and it was funny. My father was always very disapproving of the boyfriends I brought home. He was like, what is that? (laughs) You know, it's like he can't even throw a football. (laughs) So he was always like, and he said, that's not going to (laughs) work. And then um, when I went to college, um, I started to experiment or date um, a woman And I had my own thing going on in my head about that. I was deeply ashamed. I was deeply ashamed. You know, there was no joyous um, revelation like, oh, I found my place. Now I know. And, um, you know, I'm sleeping with a woman. Isn't this perfect? I was deeply, deeply ashamed. I remember walking on campus and I had my head down and I couldn't look up. Even though I was, you know, the term big man on campus, I was. At Rutgers, we didn't have a an equivalent male, even in New Jersey, in professional sports, we didn't have the headlines when I was, and it was so strange because at that time, women's sports were just not there. This was the eighties, but the newspaper, the media fell in love with our team. And I was, so I was certainly, everyone was like, hi, Sue, hi, Sue, hi, Sue. And I'm looking down deeply ashamed of myself um, for being this deviant, this pervert. And, um, you know, it was just a a remarkable moment being this adored um, person. And people want to come sit at our table, come on over, come to our party, come to our frat party. And being deeply ashamed that if they knew this one thing about me, I certainly wouldn't be invited or liked or um, accepted. And maybe they would retract all my headlines and, (laughs) you know, not let me play on the team. But it was a different time. The 80s were so different. They had We had um, Rainy Portland, who was the coach at Penn State. It was acceptable. Um, they came to my house to recruit me in high school. And she said, well, Mrs. Wicks, to my mom, um, you don't have to worry about Susan playing with lesbians because we don't allow them on the team. How someone could say that, right? Um, mm. So th- it was wow. that. Wow. You don't have to worry. And my mom, Mm -hmm. God bless her, her response was, well, you know, I'm sending my daughter to college in the hopes that she's going to meet different people and explore different things and and, and see the world, not to live in the um, artificial, structured, um, protective world that's not a true reflection of what's going on. It's not an education. It's not, you know, how I would like to see her develop in this world. Um, So I didn't go to Penn State. Was um was your dad very sporty? Um, my dad was a bayman, so he worked on the water. Um, no, he was, you know, he would play basketball once in a while, and it was just I couldn't stop laughing because he was unskilled. And in basketball, you need <laughs> skill. So he had brute strength, but you can't do anything with that. So uh, my father used to crack me up when he would try and play, which was very rare. Um. I think in spirit, um, my father's a very hard physical worker 
And I think that would be the backbone of who I was as an athlete. I was very um, hardworking, dedicated, you know, focused, intense athlete. And I think that would come from my dad. And then the spicy part of me, that um, um, (laughs) sassy part would come from my mom. You know, the the very aggressive part would be from my mom. So those those are some, you know, it's not Mm. just how fast you can run, but there's a lot of... um, who you are, your character that are sports. So all of those characteristics that I inherited from my parents definitely came out. And sometimes I can see that in other things I do. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that's my (laughs) mom. Don't we all? (laughs) As a product of the 50s, you know, both your parents, do you think that they were in, in reaction to, I mean, it seems like they're pretty open about, you know, not putting these specific kind of societal confines of, gender definitions or, you know, any of these like previous definitions. Um, and they seem pretty open-minded. Do you think that that was like in reaction to their upbringing? What, like, what do you think that came from in terms of their own backgrounds and then how I they nurtured you? They were both aware of the crushing of the human spirit mm. by um, trying to make people fit into a box. Mm. And that's all, you know, I think it really comes down to that. So my coming out story is my mother wrote me a letter before I came out to them. And she wrote basically, you know, I was a sophomore in college and they just, they were like, we realize that you're under a lot of pressure and you're experiencing all these, these new things. And we don't want you to have the pressure of coming out to us as gay. We know that you're gay. Even if I didn't fully know it, because in college I was dating guys as well, um, because I didn't know. And the guys that I dated, I admired deeply. So I had this deep admiration for them that I I thought was kind of maybe that was love, but maybe I wanted to be them. Like I wanted to be their best friends. So I had all these fantastic guy friends and I would go out on (laughs) dates with them. And then there would be the makeout part of the date. And then I'd be like, oh, this date really went. (laughs) Wow. <laughs> everything was going great we have so much fun you had to pull that up and ruin the date so that would always happen or you know I had my own room in, in college but I always be like oh my roommate's sleeping can't invite you up sorry <laughs> oh wow that's great <laughs> <laughs> well, it must have been quite a dichotomy in college at Rutgers because, I mean, to this day, you hold the record in, in most points scored, both in, in both male or female. You were the big person on campus. And then but then you held mm-hmm. all this, as you were saying, all this shame, all this sort of like or yeah. this, you know, this story that you were hiding. How How did you negotiate that? How did you manage that? socially and otherwise while you were in college and also after your mom's letter to you <laughs> exactly the letter was great and you know it was great um, my, my brothers obviously weren't allowed to bring their girlfriends over to sleep over but mine somehow <laughs> slid in because there weren't defined rules on that even though they did. and my brother was like what do you think they're doing the thing we're not allowed to do in there what why oh they're <laughs> <laughs> so it was a win-win on that one. Um, all I know is this, that I struggled like so many of us do. And we have so many things that we struggle with, whether it's our, our place of birth, the color of our skin, to be different. Uh, we all have it. And I think at the end, at, at looking back, I think it made me a more sensitive person to other people. I think it informed who I am and it gave me a different sensitivity um, to be more inclusive, to see people struggle. And it's not just open-minded, it's empathy that um, not everyone gets to experience when they put themselves in a box and they're like, well, this is right and this is normal and everything else outside of it is not. So, you know, when they say things will happen, along your life to make you see things differently. Um, I have a sister that's very, 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 very Christian. And she's led her life in that way and very dedicated to it and had very, you know, boxed in views on how things should be. But life would not let her alone. You know, life kept throwing her things and um, 
through her children, through her experiences, through her marriage, that it made her um, less rigid, more open, more empathy, um, and a willingness to see that we're all the same no matter what we're doing, and we're all in a struggle, and we're all human, and life is precious and short, and our connections to one another are are bigger than um, being normal or fitting in a box. And I don't know. Mm-hmm. For me, it was always a celebration of diversity. And I, I remember speaking um, at different places to gay youth. We used to call it gay youth. I don't know. We have so many. We don't call it that anymore. But um, they were high schools that they were separate from um, general population for their own safeties. Um, so I was like, what a crime that these colorful, beautiful people are not in the general population. And it's yes, for their safety, but for all those kids that don't have them in their high school class, that don't you know, have that point of reference, do you know a gay person? Um, those different things that are missing. I feel there, Rob, like that tapestry that makes um, our humanity so beautiful is its diversity. At the end of it all, we're all just human going through that life. And it's no matter what, whether you're the star of the campus, you are still going through life. Mm-hmm. And it's um, it's beautiful. And a lot of times it's brutal. Mm-hmm. And what was the thing that kind of took you to the other side from shame to kind of this bold courage? Because you were one of the first to be, you know, an out professional female athlete, you know, um, and being vocal Mm -hmm. public space. And so from that shame in college to that other side, yeah. What, what did that take? I think I had a long time. Um, so I was playing in Europe for 11 years and a long time to be with myself, a long Mm -hmm. time to experience myself and find out who I was and, um, to like myself. And, and, you know, what could have happened is if we had professional sports, um, a a league 10 years earlier, um, and they had attempted to have leagues and they would have the girls dress a certain way, uh, wear makeup, um, they would teach them etiquette, Mm -hmm. different things that are so absurd and ridiculous. And especially when you see um, the girls, they were essentially in drag and very uncomfortable um, in those outfits, like some like it hot type of, you know, outfits. like, yeah, the whole thing. <laughs> oh my God, like, playing basketball, my goodness, sweating. That's horrible. <laughs> so I, I didn't have to, I wasn't in that box and I didn't have sponsors that I, I was going to let down. I didn't have a league I was going to let down. I was in Europe 10 years as an American, a little bit separate, a little bit different, experiencing myself and getting to know myself. And then when I came to the Liberty, they were promoting the league towards families and not families in Brooklyn and, and New York City, but middle of America. So they promoted family, very heterosexual um, front to that. Mm. But you could be who you were. And um, right. I was who I was. So there's no... It was a, gr- a slow, gradual, lots of bumps. Um, certainly there were times when people will ask me if I was gay. And sometimes for their comfort, I think, I said um, answers like, I don't know. <laughs> right. <laughs> In Japan, um, I was 26 years old and I played with girls that were very young. They were 20, 21, but they seemed so young to me. And one of the girls kept coming to my house, bringing me food and asked me if I was gay. And I was like, oh my gosh, she's gay. And she wants me to say that I am. And I'm like, I don't know. I gotta go to bed now. (laughs) (laughs) I had to avoid it because I didn't want to get into deeper um, things. As a supreme player and and being so visible during that time with, with, with the league, do you think that that was also somewhat helpful because people maybe wouldn't even bother or want to think about your sexuality? Did you feel like you, you were confronted about your sexuality quite often? You know, I had my life that I was an open gay woman in New York City going out, um, certainly going to, you know, um, marriage equality, you know, all these different things. My, um, so that was my life. And then when I played basketball, I, I felt I was this basketball player. Um, the worlds collided because after a game, I would walk out of the front of Madison Square Garden and there would be thousands of people waiting. 
um, for an autograph and they all wanted to tell you about themselves or hand you a letter or hand you a phone number or something like that. And a lot of the feedback I got from the women that went to the games were like, the jumbo camera is going around that arena and I'm kissing my girlfriend and they skip right over us. And then they take a picture of this heterosexual and it's not cool because we are the majority of your fan base. And we're being ignored and there's something not right about it. And it was, you know, in the late 90s, we've been through, I would say the 90s were the decade of the lesbian. I, I would venture to say that. And it then was. there's a different community that was built with the WNBA in the city. Mm. People were going there that might not go out to the club or wasn't, they weren't lipstick, fabulous, you know, New York City lesbians. They were like, this is my place. They found their place and it was their community and they owned it and they were the vibrancy and they were the pulsating um, presence in Madison Square Garden. And then you're going to deny their existence. So that Mm -hmm. was um, a little bit crushing, I think. So I would get all of this feedback about that and I'd be like, yeah, um, I agree with you. I agree. That's what's happening. And um, then we had players that were, um, you know, products of the 80s and from the South and had families and you did not come out, you know. Mm, and wow. one thing yeah. with an athlete, you you really do grow up being maybe possibly your family's favorite child. They don't say it, but you, you grow up through high school being the favorite um, student. And oh my gosh, you gave us so much pride. Then it extends out to your whole community and they're, you know, you're the pride and they project onto you something maybe that you're not. And they put you in this thing and just focus on that. So those are the girls that I played with. They were the pride and joy of their family. And Maybe possibly everyone knew they were gay in their um, family, but they didn't say it. And that was the difference. That was the difference. You know, there was there was a deniability there that um, you could still be so proud of your, mm-hmm. your athlete, if, even if she was a lesbian. And I certainly, after I, I came out, they, I was just asked, you know, by a magazine, um, Time Out magazine, uh, and it was the first um, reporter that asked me the question that asked mm-hmm. me if I was um, a lesbian. I was like, yes. Um, and, I, you know, I didn't feel there was anything to add, you know, and say, are you a top or a bottom? No. Mm-hmm. And so we just <laughs> left it there. And that became the story. And um, I think some of my mm-hmm. teammates were afraid or girls around the league were afraid I was going to out them. <laughs> Mm-hmm. No, it's just, yes, I am. And that was the end of that. We were in the middle of a championship run and our um, the media person had all of these interviews that they wanted me to do for, you know, gay publications, um, lesbian publications. And I was like, I made the statement and and then a bunch of awards. Will you come accept this award? And... I wasn't running away from it, but I don't think that I had, um, at that moment, the time to do it or um, even the vocabulary Mm. or enough to speak about it, to be articulate and an advocate and um, an activist. I was just that. It wasn't anything that I was prepared to be anyone's cover girl for. I, I always felt the essence of who I am, that's it. It's not so much words. It's it's an athletic thing. Like you are the energy that you contain. I, I'm going to be proud. I'm going to be me. And I'm going to, you know, hold myself with anybody in any room. And that's the energy that um, myself pride. I'm not staring down on my shoes anymore um, in deep shame. But I didn't feel I was the person to step out and be an activist. And and we have that now um, in the WNBA. I mean, the, the strong um, mm. power of them using their voice in Black Lives Matter. But not every, um, even our Black athletes could be trapped into mm-hmm. saying the wrong thing, a controversial thing, something that can sidetrack um, the objectives of it. Because we have very young, um, athletes are young. They're, you know, and they're very focused on one thing and, and sometimes it's not. Um, but that education does occur now in sports. That does occur and that's a conversation and um, a sharing 
that is occurring. So um, activism in sports, obviously it happened with Muhammad Ali. And then along the way, there was a lot of athletes knocked out of the box um, and you're out of here. You're not playing anymore. You're not on this team. You, you've said too much and that's not where we're going. And now we have a point um, where all the athletes are like, you know what? We're all saying it. We're going to kick us all out. And um, the league, um, the NBA um, is behind them 100 percent. Did you ever feel like your queerness or your being out would have been a liability to your career? Or were you ever told that? No, I think um, at that point, no, no. Um, But it was still considered a big deal. It was enough Billie Jean King came over and thanked me. It was enough Martina was like, that was very brave. It was, you know, enough that the women before me that were truly, you know, very brave. were like, that was really awesome. So now we're at a point where um, if a WNBA player, they don't come out anymore, but they announce that they're getting married. They announce that they're having a Mm -hmm. child, which I love. I mean, this is... Because you're like, uh, coming out was almost like a confession. Mm-hmm. Like, I committed this crime and I continue to commit this crime. <laughs> but now you're like, I'm celebrating both yeah. and mm-hmm. I'm married. And I I just love that one. I mean, that's right, 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 right. And it's always when they have these great um, yeah. wedding shots. And so, mm. I, you know, how the algorithm has your news feed. My news feed is just filled with lesbians get married (laughs) having kids yeah Yeah. that's all that comes down it's like wow so much is going on in the world i i find it really interesting um the part of your story because our film is about the early 90s or about the 90s and then also about queer spaces and so your trajectory of you know playing basketball and then going internationally but then coming to new york city and you can kind of like you know, thrive in this kind of queer nightlife scene or just um, all these spaces, whether it be for, you know, athletes or like Wanda's parties or, you know, that, that you can be in spaces where you can be yourself and how, you know, I just wondered, I know for myself and for a lot of us in our, in our film, it really nurtured and supported our, um, you know, boldness and being out and um, just giving us a sense of place and knowing that, this is not something that is, you know, abnormal or, you know, and so to be able to see, see it mirrored outside in the world, like how that would kind of also strengthen you. Like did New York also serve um, like that kind of support system in your life and in your coming out and queerness? Absolutely. (laughs) Absolutely. The first one that happened was I was playing in Israel. So that was the first space that I was in. Most teams are owned by men. Mm. So I was in um, Israel. The team was owned by women, coached by women, managed wow. by women, and they were partners. Um, and they were had big voices in Israel. So to be in that locker room, even though other teams I was on, they had queer women, but they were so quiet about mm. it and hiding themselves. Even if you both said you're um, gay, it would still be a secret, and it was shameful. So when I was on that team, that space, amazing. I wasn't hooking up with my teammates, um, but I felt so comfortable. And it was the same ratio of straight and gay on any team that I've been on, except the place, the 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 um, locker room, the place that they created was safe to express yourself and be yourself. So that was my first experience of really like, oh my gosh, I feel just comfortable, mm. like exhaled a little bit and not watching my pronouns and not watching even, you know, how I sit or how I hold on myself or how I, you know, maybe look at a girl that walks by those different things that everyone seemed to be always ego focused to see if you made some mistake. And it's like, "Ah, I knew it. (laughs) (laughs) And then New York City before um, I played for the New York Liberty, I would go out, um, I would come home from Europe and, um, I would go into the city and my experience going to the city or to a Wanda party, it was like, you know, the cartoon with the country wolf and, and he goes and he sees the girls and he's like hitting his head. And stuff. I just couldn't believe my eyes. And, you know, I was definitely felt like, 
Um, now I'm an oyster farmer, but I certainly felt more of a, like a farmer back then. Like, oh my gosh, what? They have leather chaps on and purple lipstick and great hair. And I was like, oh my God. <laughs> oh God. That sounds like Rebecca. <laughs> it was sophisticated. And I just, it was almost like one of those things that, you know, your first memories are sent. And I remember the colognes and the perfumes and the mix of those different things in the air, it was intoxicating. Um, mm. And I think I'm rather introverted. Um, so I have two two personalities. One is dancing on the table and the other one is in the corner hiding. So it's one way or the other. We don't know who's coming. But I remember I was just being like an observer and just, you know, never hooking up with anyone, but just going to this great big show and just being part of that and in that energy was nourishing and it was informative and it helped define or open up spaces to show me who I was, you know? So those were heady, heady, heady times. And um, I would always get lost in New York City. I don't know why, just in small, you know, corners around um, in the village. <laughs> I was like, where is that party? <laughs> yeah. Well, I have to tell you that it was always a pleasure to see you at the parties. And I, and you were quite quiet when I think about that you were a little bit more of an introvert. But I know that there are a lot of women that also were intimidated by you. They were afraid to go up to you and talk to you because you were revered as, as this like amazing, you know, athlete that they all went to see in the, at the garden. Celebrity. celebrity. Yeah. But I, I think sold myself. I was like, oh, they must have been intimidated. That's yeah. So they must have been poor, poor girl. I wanted to backtrack just a little <laughs> bit, if I, if I may, to your mom's letter, because I find yeah. that actually quite endearing. Mm-hmm that she helped you along in that process. And I wanted to hear more about what ensued for you after you received that. Like, how did you feel and how did you mm. move forward with with that information and that? Uncovering. <laughs> Uncovering, exactly. <laughs> outed. Yeah. yeah, my mother outed me. <laughs> I think it was very um, endearing on one level, like a, a flat, you know, um, level, like, oh, that's my mom is so sweet. But certainly without me realizing it, it took a lot of pressure off. You know, it took, um, and fear of rejection mm-hmm. from, from, you know, my mm-hmm. family. Um, cause I would say, I remember before that my freshman year, um, being really weird about, defining who I was dating or seeing anybody in college. I was very young and I would say, I think I'm asexual. Like, why did I have to default all the way to, I don't like anybody. <laughs> also, when you think about it, like, <laughs> and no one pressed me on it. And they were like, oh, you'll be okay. You'll find someone <laughs> filled with all this sexual energy. And I'm trying to pass myself off. Not just straight, but I'm going to go all the way to something maybe they've never seen before. <laughs> Oh, that makes sense. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> I, I find it's, I mean, I, even to a certain extent today, but, you know, usually women in, in um, playing professional sports, there's always this kind of um, stigma that is placed on, you know, it's always this constant having to prove yourself as a as a woman. You know, it, it, yeah, there's a sexuality aspect of it or a sexual identification, but also the gender aspect of it, like, you know, you were saying early on this kind of drag that you had to be, um, you know, slap on top of you to be presented in the sport, like when the sport was trying to sell sell itself to, you know, quote, mainstream America. And um, yeah. I just find it really interesting how, how do we define ourselves as women? Well, I know that it would flash forward maybe... Um... It was 2003 and I was at an ESPN conference and they had women on the stage and they were talking openly about lesbians. And I was like, this is so 15 years ago. We should be talking about gender right now. Mm -hmm. We should be talking about how that is on a, a spectrum. That is 
And I was just thinking how that was, even the talking about sexuality, being a lesbian in this group with executives um, and television people that were, you know, in their 50s, a lot of them, it made them nervous. They were like, Ooh. Mm. Right. but the real conversation I felt at that moment that we needed to have, like, that's, that's so past. You guys can, you know, deal with that at home and, and come <laughs> to terms with your sexuality. If you can't hear this. But we need to talk about gender and how we're all different on that. And that would open up so many different things if we could see ourselves differently, not in this binary, which is, is so dangerous that they don't want anyone to escape from. And that conversation is certainly going on mm. now. Um, and people's reaction is so violent. And that one, um, that mm. one is scary to me that it, it elicits that response. Um, but it's violent. Like they get very angry about it. And it's so like, ugh, why, mm -hmm. you know, why would you want, um, and, and the ideas of just crushing another person, just trying to express themselves in this, because we're all absolutely unique. Um, it's like taking every snowflake and just like, oh, no good. We got to get this one like that one. Everyone like this one. We can't just see the beauty of every human. Um, and we have to cause a lot of pain and suffering um, to the point mm -hmm. that people don't want to live, you know, that they can't bear to live, especially in that tender, um, that tender age um, when they're coming to know themselves and seeing something in themselves that's despised, not just frowned upon, but despised by some people that they had no, uh, you know, the person that's experiencing it had nothing to do with it. They were born that way and it, they're just seeing this in themselves. Um, so that always makes me so sad when people, humans aren't allowed to um, discover themselves, be themselves, um, let themselves shine. Um, just like those, those students that were in the, um, the high school away from the general population, everybody, is diminished by that. Everybody is diminished, whether it's by experience or by what it brings up in that person. It, it diminishes them as a human and makes them less human. And it, it crushes something beautiful, in my opinion, because no matter what, all humans to me are beautiful, especially when they are in full bloom and feel, you know, walking proudly. And how much, mm. you know, does our community contribute to the joy of the world, you know, we are such a colorful and just incredible, you know, expression of humanity and to deny the world of that, like, it's terrible. I mean, I just think about like, you know, RuPaul's Drag Race and how much joy that might bring to someone. I mean, that's a very specific expression, but it's like, that's just one aspect of who we are, you know, like we have yeah. so much under the banner of our community that it's like, wow, like, you know, you can express yourself like this. Yeah, that's the culture. And we experience that with Black Lives Matter. We love our, our Black athletes, our Black comedians, our, um, um, our Black entertainers. But it seems there, there's a deep hatred towards individual mm -hmm. Black people. How mm -hmm. do we um, come to terms with that? We have so many blind mm -hmm. spots. So many, um, misconceptions and misinformation um, that we're mm -hmm. fed um, that make the things that we love the most um, public enemy mm -hmm. number one that make life beautiful that make our culture mm -hmm. interesting and exciting and vibrant and alive um, everything that you like to see in nature so when I'm out there working mm -hmm. on the water everything has a symbiotic relationship the diversity mm -hmm. on this planet is what makes it flourish and how those things cooperate and live and move and just have their lives going on. I it makes know. it unique and exciting. Speaking of gender, oysters have no gender, right? <laughs> <laughs> they, uh, they, they fluctuate back wow. and forth. So you oh, can start perfect. out um, as a male and then, you know, Amazing. or I think they start out as a female. And then they can try their hand at being a male. <laughs> I love that. And then they can also go back. 
That's, know, that's so amazing. Hard. Is there like everything work. <laughs> are there any like organized queer communities within the oyster farming world that you operate in? Um there are a few gay women that are farmers. Um there's a couple of gay gentlemen that are farmers. Um, but we don't have I think our organization is we're oyster farmers. <laughs> I feel that, um, it's a very unique organization that everyone is like really into the, how diverse it is. Um, mm. So when we have our, our meetings, the Long Island Oyster Growers Association, it is like, this is an awesome group. You know, we get in there and we're doing essentially the same job. But when the group gets together, it's just a fun, interesting group of people that have come from different backgrounds. And it's also mm -hmm. you're passionate about the work that you're doing. So it is fun to go to our meetings. You'd think it would be like, oh, we're just going to talk. Well, we got to talk to the councilman. We got to get this done. We, you know, um, all, yes, we do that. But it's the group that you're sitting there with <sighs> that, you know, makes it fun in their outfits. It's just nice. And it's, um, <laughs> everyone is different. And how did you transition from sports to oyster farming? out on Long Island. I know that you grew up in Long Island. So that's, again, like we said earlier, full circle back. But talk a yeah. little bit about that. So, like I said, my dad was a bayman. My grandfather um, was a boat builder. My great grandfather was a captain. My great great grandfather was a rum runner. Um, there's just always been you know, on the water, it's in my family. Um, so my dad always said it was just in my blood. And that was another thing. Um, my brothers did the work and they enjoyed it, but they didn't love it. They weren't passionately moved by it. It wasn't something that they wanted to do with their life. And, my, you know, my dad always said, uh, well, Susan's the one who really loves this. So I think certainly with that, we um, had that bond that we both loved, passionately loved um, being on the water. Um, how did I get into it? I watched my father. So we are in um, a moment when our waters are, they, they're not as abundant as they were. And there's, uh, there's definitely some climate change, environmental issues that are going on that um, this once abundant, bountiful water does not provide. So my father, when I go out with my dad, we'd get to the dock and there'd be all these colorful men that were baymen that worked on the water and they'd work on the water all their life. And there were thousands of them out there. Now when I'm out on the water, there are maybe here five, five baymen that are left and they're, wow. they're only out there on their own wits and knowing how to scrape out a living, which is nothing mm. like it used to be. So, you know, mm. Long Island's always known for its seafood, but the fisheries and especially the, the clams and the oysters, there are no oh, occurring um, natural sets of the oysters anymore. The oyster farming aquaculture is the way that we reintroduce the species. Um, restoration projects are the way we mm. try to rebuild reefs. Um, so that that's an underlying um, part of it that I come back to it. I just didn't want to go out there and, and fish. I wanted to be part of something that mm -hmm. possibly maybe could help revive um, our waters and the fisheries, you know, and just be part of that because it was, it hurt me so deeply. And, um, you mm -hmm. know, to watch my father and all those other bay men, just the look on their face, because they're not people that speak a lot. They're very solitary, secretive type of people that are throwbacks from a different time. Mm -hmm. But the poetry in their face, when they watch the, you know, their livelihood and the thing that they love diminish right before them, that um, they could always earn a very honest living on the water by their, mm -hmm. you know, just they'd go out there and they'd work hard to be in mother nature, which they loved. And they didn't have a boss except themselves. And they, they could do that. And to watch that disappear and to have no control over it. And at the time when these brown tides came and they were killing it off, that scientists didn't have an answer. So that that type of thing to watch that right before your eyes. Um, I was talking with some members of Congress about this last week, and I, I would tell them the story about being a nine-year-old girl with these, you know, climbing with my father and these, these mountainous sand dunes, um, 
that no longer exist due to erosion, they're gone. And on this, you know, sand flat, watching the abundance of life and seagrass and crabs and oysters and clams and all these things in there, they're just thousands of things to make a nine-year-old girl scream. They're gone, you know, like I would be screaming, I mean, ah, ah, you know, just stepping on a flounder or a wheel through my legs or, you know, something terrifying. Mm. But that abundance is gone. And so I could speak to it, you know, in the course of my lifetime to watch that mm. disappear. And this this place for me, this other world that it's part of the universe, just like our world and just as important that our um, interactions with nature has destroyed so much of this. How, how can we be part of restoring it? And I also wanted to be on the water. I wanted to be there. And I, you know, something I wanted to do, something very honest every day. You know, I know um, I'm going to earn my living. And I, I like that part about it. So, yeah, there's a part, the environmentalist. And then there is um, that it's joyous for me. Um, and it's restorative. And it, it feels like my natural place in the world is to be in in the water, you know, with all those beautiful creatures. Beautiful. Do you see a um, Do you see a movement uh, towards more rehabilitation since you've been doing your oyster farming uh, out there? And then also, is the Army Corps of Engineers involved at all in trying to restore mm-hmm. or help? Uh, that area as they have in, in many other places? Absolutely. So what was so rewarding is um, every place, just like every person, is different. And every solution is different. So in New York City, after Sandy, the Army Corps of Engineers came in and you know started to build um, parks with mm-hmm. seawalls, um, with Staten Island, some oyster um, restoration for storm surge, and that seawall and, you know, putting concrete and, and barriers and things, that's for New York City. That's a perfect um, solution for that that place. Now you go to another place, another bay, another estuary, totally different. We have a totally different situation. So when we get to speak to Congress and tell them, listen, I'm on the water every day. And let me tell you about the place that I'm in because... There's no scientists. There's nobody from the Army Corps of Engineers. Yes, they look at it differently, but they're not seeing it day to day to day to day to day to day. The same way that you know about lesbians in the 90s is is because you saw them day to day. You Mm -hmm. saw the movement. You saw the whole thing. So that is the same thing with when they ask um, the people that are working on the water. What do you see? What do you think? Um, What are solutions? And what we've done in this little town I live in, we just started a nature conservancy. And what I've found, let's say from marriage equality, um, from anything that I've done, it's grassroots. Mm. Your politicians do not take the lead. They wait until you have critical right. mass and then they come to the front All of your right. parade. So what we've done here is we started our nature conservancy and we will do things that are very specific to our area to help with storm surge, to help preserve our our wetlands um, and the health of the bay with um, eelgrass restoration, which is a cornerstone where every, it's like the nursery where everything starts um, to help them talk about, hey, let's change the way we have our septic. Let's, you know, move houses back a little bit. Let's put this back to nature. Let's put this in the conservancy. So those those types of things that, Ten years ago, I certainly five years ago, I wouldn't have seen myself doing. But there's an urgency to it, and if you don't do it, who's going to do it? So, if you don't make that film, who's going to make it? If you don't open that club, who's going to do it? If you don't, Mm -hmm. (laughs) if you don't, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, play professional basketball like when I was a kid, it didn't exist. Professional basketball didn't exist for women, but I was like, I'm going to be a professional basketball player. And it's not here now, mm. but I'm going to be ready for when it comes here. So the same thing. Um, we have a new administration um, that's very um, in tune to the climate. And now's the time to start to have that ready. If we do, that's how change happens. It happens. Da, 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 little, 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 and boom, 
everyone's on board. And then you get your your leaders in legislation and um, Congress and uh, voting on these things and the bills that will will protect us. And and it's an uphill battle. And just like our gay rights, always under um, fire, like our rights as women, always under fire. But that doesn't mean we don't um, fight every day and it never be under the illusion that the fight is over. I think we learned in the last right. four years. Mm-hmm. We're vulnerable. Right. Absolutely. Totally. I think that's really beautiful. Like I think um, the way queer folks can contribute in so many different ways from that kind of collective history of activism and our own experiences and that kind of grassroots activism and how we bring that into other battles. So the environmental causes, I think about um, women's equal pay, you know, that coming out of a very specific part of this country yeah. um, where there is a lot of queer activism, you know, near the San Francisco area and how that kind of translated into the surf communities and then kind of resonated from there. I mean, it uh, certainly was happening before, but that that being kind of like a perfect storm of community and who was there, you know, even though it, it might seem like a world away between the WNBA and queer activists kind of front lines and being an oyster farmer, that kind of intersection and all the histories that you bring to it as a pioneering female athlete, as a, you know, queer activist and, um, and now an environmentalist slash oyster farmer is just wonderful. And it kind of sheds light to this beautiful richness that we embody in New York, you know, that we have the city, we have Long Island, we have all these beautiful, um, environments that, and cultures that all intersect. It's wonderful. And that you embody all of that. It's just a natural because civil rights, black rights, um, they are very related to climate change. Um, these mm-hmm. things are happen in the worst neighborhoods. They ha- happen on that, that mm-hmm. side of the town where they do have the factory that um, everyone mm-hmm. in that town, on that side of the town has asthma. Everyone, um, um, Hurricane Katrina, we know the houses Absolutely. that didn't get rebuilt. Mm-hmm. We know the people that were displaced. We know the um, people that came back and bought their houses and right. they can't afford to live there anymore. Climate change and, you mm-hmm. know, it's not going to affect mm-hmm. a lot of people. But we have a, a lot of white people, a lot of white males. And that's the voice that is the biggest voice in the room. Mm-hmm. The more black voices, women voices, mm-hmm. queer voices that we have. And we, we are in a, a, a time now that those voices are being heard mm-hmm. and amplified um, through writing, through filmmaking, through podcast, mm-hmm. um, through independent, you know, self-publishing, um, and people are listening. And those are the voices, I think, that lead us away from the patriarchy that is a destructive force mm-hmm. um, and their solutions. Because you mentioned the Army Corps of Engineers, a lot of their solutions are, oh, we'll throw up a seawall and we'll concrete. Right. And you know what? Mother Nature is always talking if you're listening. And people are always talking if you're listening. And they have real solutions because they are inside the problem. So that, I, I, I pray and I hope that we're part of that movement, that these voices will be heard. I know I'm a person that definitely had to decolonize my bookshelves. Um, that I had so many books that needed to be read, and they were all white males from the Northeast, um, you know, the movies and the leads and things. I lived that. So even as a woman, you know, to be so blind to that's what I was consuming all the time, that now I make a conscious effort to read different voices. Um, mm. And they're there now. They're right there right. for us to grab. Right. Hey, try No this. excuses now. Read this. Listen to this. Well, we have a similar situation in Puerto Rico. I mean, I'm living it as we speak, you know, after Hurricane Maria, uh, we had an incredible amount of erosion, a lot of damage on the west side of the island where we are. And myself and a group of concerned, you know, citizens there have been really trying hard to find a solution moving forward on how we can protect not only the waters and uh, the surrounding areas, but also the homes and the businesses and the families, et cetera. And we recently got the Army Corps of Engineer proposal that took three years for their scoping work. And it's exactly what you said. Their proposal for our area is to throw up a rock wall that will completely um, take away the beach with a walkway uh, for people to walk along the rock wall. 
<laughs> and it will totally, you know, change the, um, the, the waters and the habitat and et cetera. So there's been obviously uh, an incredible amount of opposition to that. Uh, the other two solutions would be to do nothing and let, let Mother Nature take its course. And the other hybrid solution would be to do some sort of reef, natural reef kind of thing to maybe protect from another like heavy impacted event. So yeah, climate change is quite real and, um, you know, and how one deals with, with all of this is something else. But I wanted to also uh, ask you a very specific question because yeah. we had a very interesting uh, interview with someone that practices um, agricultural farming and in Puerto Rico. And I wanted to ask you if you had anything to say on how maybe team sports and your queerness, how that may have informed or is informing how you actually do your oyster practice. Uh, and if you've noticed that there's uh, a difference between how you engage with your uh, landscape versus someone else because of your inherent way that you've lived your life. That I would have to reflect on deeply. Um, I think... Um, you, because you're such a compassionate person, you know, you have so much empathy and it's so beautiful to hear. Um, somewhat self-abusive and abused by the world, right? That it makes us very, it softens us and or makes us like diamonds. I'm not sure, but all of those things occurring. Um, sometimes, you know, I have been asked about the question because there are female um, farmers, um, and there are men farmers and what's the difference and is this a man's field and i think <laughs> part of it they would say oh the hard work and um is the man part and i'm like you should see my mother work oh my exactly. goodness um and then there's the nurturing part that they want to attribute to women and i would say my father certainly made my mm -hmm. lunch and um took, took me care my of the kids yeah. and um consoled me when i lost my games um so there was nurturing there these things that we want to do, that's male, that's female, they're contained in me and they're contained mm. in the male farmers that I know. And maybe they, they rely on different things. But I think what we all do is sort of like, here's our situation. We each have a unique bay or body of water we're working mm. with. And we know you cannot fight the, the tide. You cannot fight Mother Nature. The best you can do is let her work with you. And then one day she's going to knock everything down because she's very temperamental and you have to just start again. So that would be, um, I think a defining optimism that all your hard work will mm. pay off your, um, or, or even if it doesn't, mm -hmm. you're in it full heartedly, mm -hmm. um, with an optimistic heart that you're going in a direction. I wouldn't say that they're male, female characteristics that I see. Um, if they informed me, um, it was that it's good to be passionate, to be in love with something and to search out the things that um, you feel when your soul mm. is right. You feel when these things are working um, and to be a lesbian works for me. The same way when I was after my date kissing the guy that I was, you know, loved so much. I just didn't want that to feel right. So to be in, in aware of what works for me as a human, that kind of stuff certainly works on my farm you know, because it is passion, it's love, and it's something that I'm extremely motivated about that that moves me. And um, if I'm pushing too hard or going in a different direction, I feel it. I have this voice that says, okay, you know, pull back or do it this way. Or don't worry so much about money. Don't worry so much about other things. Just do your thing and know that's why you want to do it. Just to do it is enough mm -hmm. for me. So thinking about um, LGBT peoples and professional sports, I think the women have gone a, a lot further than the men because there's so much stigma perhaps for, you know, men. Um, but where do you think the movement can continue to move forward in like the realm of professional athletes? So I think it's a great place um, for acceptance mm -hmm. because we work in small locker rooms together where teamwork um, and respect are critical mm -hmm. to making it function because nothing will kill a team more than disrespect or um, the crushing of another person or anything like that. that that'll ruin your mm -hmm. team any locker room whether it's 
um, the NFL, with all of those different guys from all different walks of life and different political beliefs, different um, religious beliefs, mm-hmm. different socioeconomic backgrounds, they all come together and they're working towards a common goal. Um, and in the end, right. I, I know for me, it's the color, the sexuality, all those things really do fade down. And you just see the person as, you know, it's character is a big thing in sports. And can I count on this person? Can I rely on this person? And, or if I can't, when can I not? Like you're mm-hmm. always just checking in with that person. So sports are a great place because it's very intense and stuff is going to go wrong. So we learned a lot, you know, about one another during this pandemic, right? Because this is a crunch, messed up time that it pushed us all to the limits and we learned stuff about ourselves. Mm -hmm. And sports are kind of like that in a a safer environment that you're going to be pushed to your limit and um, you're going to react well sometimes and other times maybe not so well. And you're constantly working on your reaction and modulating your your emotions and, and how you interact with people and taking care of your relationship in the long term and not just flying off the handle and saying things that cannot be unsaid. Um, But then it's not just um, watching your mouth. It's not being politically correct. It's a genuine um, respect for the people that you're working with. Um, I think that that certainly occurs um, in a locker room, whether it's, you know, being in Israel, having a Palestinian teammate, um, extremely extremely difficult for that young lady um but watching when you work together how you start to see people differently Mm. i know that you were um coaching some college uh women's basketball teams are you still doing that no more coaching um coaching high school basketball i coach my niece's team um for the last few years and that's been very rewarding um but no more um, college coaching, no professional coaching for right now. Is that something and you miss? If if it was just a full-time job, you know, I would do it. But it's more than a full-time <laughs> job. I remember when I was co- we had like, we would, it wouldn't be like an anomaly to have like 19 hour days, like back to back oh, to back wow. to back. To back. Sounds like, like a film production. <laughs> yeah. And I, uh, <laughs> yes. And you have to love it. And I loved playing. Mm. I loved playing and I could do that all day long, every day. That could be my whole life. But coaching, I did not love 19 hours a day. Work. Mm. I liked it maybe yeah. seven hours a day work, <laughs> and then go home. <laughs> right. Have a drink. Yeah. Go for so I knew when I played basketball, um, people would say, did you see the game last night? Did you see that? And I was like, listen, I don't watch basketball anymore. I'm like um, a recovering addict. That's all I did. And if I start watching it again, right. I'm like, you know, all I can say is I become addicted. I want to see this player react in another moment. Yeah. I want to see this one develop. And oh boy, I can't wait till they play this team. <laughs> like I get so into it. It just consumes too much of my brain. So I have to just keep sports over here. And it's certainly, I just get so consumed. Luckily, you know, I don't have any kids because I would, definitely oh, <laughs> are you still in touch with some of your uh teammates yeah 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 i mean oh that's I think awesome that we're um sisters for life that's wonderful it's really been a pleasure susan thank you so much for doing this uh, really a pleasure to to speak to you and to hear your story not just the the basketball and the queer stuff oh, but okay. the oyster yeah. farming and all your environmental activism and just thank you for everything really across the board from the beginning to now and and then to the future yeah thank you thank you for listening if you want to learn more about sue wick's oyster farm check out violetcoveoysters.com and to learn more about harbor restoration initiatives visit billionoysterproject.org you can learn more about us and our film at cafetobacfilm.com and at Cafe Tobac Film on social media. Please share your thoughts with us on social media. And if you have a coming out story that you'd like to share for a possible feature here, reach out to us. Thanks for listening.